your guide to growing dill. This tangy herb is unique because both its seeds and leaves are used as a seasoning. Dill is a great addition to pickles, salad dressings, and fish dishes. It's also pretty nutritious. It's got lots of great vitamins and minerals packed in. Fern leaf. This variety has a compact growth habit, long-lasting flavor, and bushy leaves. Bouquet, a variety that's typically used with fresh cut flowers or for pickling. Tetra and Ducat. They have a bright green color, strong flavor, and are slow bolting. When starting dill, keep in mind that its ideal soil temperature for germination is between 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 to 21 degrees Celsius. Here's how to start your dill seeds. Step one, dill can be grown in containers, both inside and outside. Just make sure your container is deep enough to accommodate its long roots. Step two, plant your seedlings about one inch, 2.5 centimeters deep, and 12 to 15 inches, 30 to 38 centimeters apart. Step three, cover your seeds lightly with soil after pressing them down. They'll also need some light in order to germinate, so be sure to stick them in a sunny spot. Step four, after they've reached the soil surface, thin your plants to nine inches, 22 centimeters apart, and place the rows 12 inches, 30 centimeters apart. It does prefer a soil pH of 5.6 to 6.5. Keep in mind that if you're growing your plants inside, they'll need five to six hours of direct sunlight per day. That's because dill grows best in full sun. As well, the oil content in their leaves increases with long days and higher temperatures. However, temperatures above 95 degrees Fahrenheit, 35 degrees Celsius, will decrease the seed production of your dill. On the other end of the spectrum, dill is a hardy plant, tolerating air temperatures down to 25 degrees Fahrenheit, negative 3.5 degrees Celsius. You'll want to make successive seedings every three weeks so that you can have a continuous harvest. As well, keep in mind that you might need to support these long plants with a stake. Dill doesn't need overly rich soil. So if you add fertilizer once at the beginning of the growing season, that'll work just fine. Depending on your soil's needs, you can use a 20 to 20 to 20 solution or a 15 to five to zero fertilizer. You can either broadcast it, spread it on your soil while planting, or side dress the fertilizer by applying it to each plant. Transplanting best practices. If you want to start your dill inside, you can do so in peat pods about six to seven weeks before you plan on transplanting. Technically, once they're big enough to grow in pods, you could transplant them outside, but it's much easier to work with a mature plant rather than with a seedling. Note, dill seedlings tend to bolt when transplanted, so you'll have to be very careful when handling your seedlings. Companion plants do's and don'ts. Do's. Cabbage and brassicas will help keep your dill plants healthy. As well, corn, cucumber, lettuce, and onions are also great companion plants. Don'ts. You'll want to avoid planting with or near carrots and tomatoes because these crops are susceptible to the same diseases as dill. Bonus fact. Dill attracts bees, butterflies, wasps, lady beetles, lacewings, hoverflies, tachinid flies, and parsley worms, making it a great companion plant for others. If you see tiny bright green caterpillars, parsley worms on your dill's leaves, don't pick them. Those are the harmless larvae of swallowtail butterflies. Growing structure options. Open field. Since dill is quite a hardy plant, you can sow it directly into a field. Just make sure that the planting spot you choose has dill's ideal soil and light conditions. Containers. These are a great alternative when your garden space is limited. Depending on how big they are, 
you'll have the flexibility to put them in the perfect spot with ideal growing conditions. It's also super important that they have drainage holes. This ensures that water can thoroughly wet the soil without soaking it, which will prevent any diseases from festering. As well, soil should be at least six inches deep. Dill roots need enough space to develop, so the deeper, the better. Raised beds. With this structure, you don't have to step on the soil like an open field. You can simply access your dill from both sides and reach every spot. As well, they provide more space than containers and have really good water drainage. Staking the plants. This keeps the hollow dill stalks from snapping when they are exposed to strong wind. You'll want to attach them lightly to a wooden or iron stick, but be careful not to damage them. Make sure they aren't bound too tightly. They should still have some room to move around in the wind. Aphids. These tiny pests come in a variety of colors, green, black, red, light orange, or yellow, and mainly feed on the undersides of leaves and stems. What they're actually feeding on is the sap in plants, which ends up causing the plants damage. Aphids also leave behind a sticky substance called honeydew, and they are a pest that's known to spread diseases. Aphids can be tolerated by most plants when their numbers are low, but if there's a lot of aphids, they can stunt a plant's growth and cause a plant's leaves to turn yellow and fall off. Here's what to do. For the most part, plants can handle mild aphid infestations, but if they're found, a strong jet of water from a garden hose will wash them off the plants. Spraying plants with water should be done early in the morning so that the plants can dry off during the day. Sticky traps, neem oil, insecticidal soaps, and horticultural oils are also effective against aphids. Just be sure to follow the application instructions on the packaging. Oftentimes, you can also get rid of aphids by wiping or spraying the leaves with a mild solution of water and a few drops of dish soap. One variation includes adding a pinch of cayenne pepper. Soapy water should be reapplied every two to three days for about two weeks. As well, you can try to attract beneficial insects like lady beetles, hoverflies, and lacewings, all of which are important aphid predators. Make sure to check all transplants for aphids before planting. And keep in mind that aphids aren't very mobile, so it's not uncommon to find one heavily affected plant surrounded by plants that are fine. If this is the case, simply remove and destroy the infected plant. Army worms. Army worms are green, reddish, or black caterpillars that heavily feed on the leaves of plants, turning them into skeleton leaves that are filled with lots of irregular or circular shaped holes. These pests are most active in the early morning and the late evening, which are the best times to check for damage. Here's what to do. You can use natural enemies like wasps and flies to help keep army worms in check. Also, if you're using insecticides, it's best to do so in the twilight hours. This is when those insecticides will be the most effective. It's also important to control the growth of weeds because they serve as cover for army worms. Finally, you can simply hand pick any army worms off the plants. Cutworms. These are gray worms that curl their bodies around the stem of a plant and feed on it, which causes the plant to be cut off just above the soil surface. When their numbers are high, they can cause severe damage to the garden by causing plants to wilt and die off. Cutworms feed at night and hide in plant debris during the day, and they prey more on nutrients plants, seedlings, or young plants since their stems are more tender. There are a number of different types, but the most common are red-backed, dark-sided, and dingy cutworms. Here's what to do. Hand pick any cutworms from the plants after dark, when they're most active. Also, keep a three to four foot buffer of dry soil along the edge of the garden to make it unattractive to cutworms. As well, remove plant residue to help reduce egg-laying sites and get rid of weeds, which can host young cutworm larvae. 
Be sure to till the garden before planting, which helps to expose and kill any larvae that might be present. Also, use compost instead of green manure, since manure might encourage egg laying. As well, try placing aluminum foil or cardboard collars around the plants to create a barrier, which will stop cutworm larvae from feeding. Simply place the collars around the plants so that one end is pushed a few inches into the soil and the other end is several inches above the ground. Adding a layer of mulch will also help to prevent any cutworms from reaching the soil surface. And natural predators like wasps and ground beetles also help to control cutworm infestations. Finally, try spreading diametaceous earth, essentially a soft powder made from the bones of tiny aquatic creatures around the plant's base. This creates a sharp barrier that will keep cutworms out. Nematodes. Also known as roundworms, nematodes are microscopic worms that live in the soil as well as inside plant tissue. They stunt the growth of plants and cause galls, swelled growths, to form on a plant's roots, leaving them quite deformed. As well, leaves can become pale and twisted. Crops will eventually turn yellow from the damage and will then wilt in hot weather. A plant's yield can be affected by nematode damage and in extreme cases, plants can die off entirely. Here's what to do. Practice crop rotation and plant-resistant varieties. As well, be sure to remove infected plants or plant residue to prevent nematodes from spreading to the next round of crops. Plant roots can be checked for galls, swelled growths, either mid-season or earlier if symptoms appear. If any galls are found, those affected plants should then be removed. Also, avoid spreading nematodes by thoroughly cleaning any garden equipment and by not moving any infected soil. Carrot Motley Dwarf The leaves of an affected plant will turn yellow and red, and the plant's growth will get stunted. Here's what to do. If possible, avoid planting dill near any overwintered carrots. Damping off. This is one of the most common problems when starting plants from seed. Seedlings will emerge and appear healthy. Then suddenly they'll wilt and die for no obvious reason. Damping off is caused by a fungus that thrives in moist conditions and when soil and air temperatures are above 68 degrees Fahrenheit. It could also thrive when soils have too much nitrogen fertilizer. This fungus favors slow-growing, deeply seeded plants. The stems of affected plants become water-soaked and will eventually collapse, while roots become too water-soaked and damaged to function. Older plants can also be affected, and either those older plants become stunted or they will collapse. Damping off can be spread three different ways, either in water, by contaminated soil, or on gardening equipment. Here's what to do. When possible, plant disease-free seeds. Keep seedlings moist, but avoid overwatering the seedlings to keep the soil from getting too wet. And try to keep the soil from getting too cold. Raised beds are usually a great option for planting, since raised beds help with drainage. Also, avoid over-fertilizing seedlings, and thin the seedlings out to avoid overcrowding, and to make sure the seedlings are getting good air circulation. If containers are being used, those containers should be thoroughly washed in soapy water, and then rinsed in a 10% bleach solution after each use. If any plants are affected with damping off, remove them from the garden, and then practice a crop rotation of two to three years. Leaf blight. This disease starts with a small number of circular reddish purple spots that appear on the leaves of an affected plant. Spots will eventually grow to V-shaped lesions that are light brown towards the middle and dark brown on the edges. The whole leaf may turn brown, 
and in severe cases, these lesions then cause the leaves of affected plants to curl up and die. Here's what to do. Plant disease-free seeds. Practice crop rotation and avoid planting in a spot where potatoes, peppers, or tomatoes have just grown. It also helps to plant in light, well-drained soil in a spot that gets all-day sun and good air circulation. As well, control the growth of weeds, since they reduce air circulation and increase drying time for leaves. The longer the leaves are wet, the more prone they are to disease. Finally, be sure to remove any infected leaves after harvest, which can help control diseases. Their leaves can be harvested as soon as they're big enough, but they are most flavorful when picked before flowering. When you're harvesting your dill, you'll want to clip closely to the stem, and it's best to do so either in the early morning or in the evening. The seed heads of your dill plant should be harvested about two to three weeks after flowering. You can dry them and use the seeds again, either for new dill plants or for pickling. The seeds and leaves can be dried for better storage, but they'll lose most of their flavor. You can also try freezing the leaves in ice cube trays filled with water, which will keep them fresh longer and preserve their flavor. When using dill for pickling, make sure to take every part of the plant, the stem, leaves, flowers, and seeds. Note, dill loses its flavor when cooked in high temperatures.